To give people ample opportunity to catch up and rewatch it or watch it for the first time, I've put a pause on the Creep series for a week. There was a three year gap between the films, so a break is thematically appropriate. So what am I going to put here instead? Well, a meta horror feels about right thematically. So why not something I wanted to do last October for Halloween, but the whole Buffy and Angel thing pushed it out of the way and I had to shelve it. Yeah, we're doing 2018's You Might Be The Killer, directed by Brett Simmons, who shares writing credits with Thomas P. Vitale and Clovis Bazoin. I hope I said those names right. This stars Fran Kranz, Alison Hannigan, Brittany S. Hall and Jenna Harvey, whose character is named for JLC. Not that one. Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. But this, like a lot of the meta horror that I, I do on this channel, came to me from somewhere that I can't remember now. It was that long ago, but I enjoyed it. I put it on my list of things that I wanted to talk about because this does something fairly unique. We've had, you know, sort of the following a killer round of Behind the Mask. We've had Scream and, you know, it's breaking apart of tropes. We've had the Creep series and its take on sort of, you know, the found footage and slashery kind of thing. But rarely have we had one where, if ever, in fact, where the main character or one of the leads seems to actually be the one responsible. And in a refreshing change for the genre, we're not teased out with little shots of just hands and maybe like, you know, a figure cloaked in shadow that maybe halfway into the film, or maybe the first third, we suddenly see. No, we see the killer and we figure out who the killer is within the first 15 minutes or so. And that is refreshing. I mean, Chuck does kind of start to figure it out. I actually looked. It's about 15 minutes in that Chuck starts to, you can see the cogs spinning. And as an audience member, you're going, wait a minute, I know where she's going with this. So the rest of the runtime, and it isn't a short film by any stretch of the imagination, the rest of the runtime is all about discovering why, how, and how to stop it. And we throw out all the tropes. We even have potential callbacks. I think some people think they are, but it might just be it was in the script anyway, you know, to uh, Alison Hannigan's career on Buffy. It talks about, you know, doing the spell and things like that. I think it was just in there. But Chuck's character is great. It's She's a great audience analogue. She you know, says everything that you're probably thinking. She's making these connections. And for those who maybe don't put puzzles together quite as quickly in the audience, she's there just to help you along a little. But there is a lot of humour in it as well. You know, she where she works is funny enough on its own. The interactions with the customers, the fact she's got a psycho mug, we all go a little mad sometimes, written on it. We have some great humour in this. You know, it, it does balance everything very well. It is primarily comedy with a horror angle, I would say, first of all. It's a bit like the Happy Death Day series in that regard. It's funny first, but then it's got the serious kind of horror bits just to keep it going. But the fact that they throw in a facial recognition joke on his phone because he's all bloody and he has to, like, pull a smiling face to do it. But there's so much, you know, like I say, the, the, it does attack the tropes of the killer and things like that. We figure out what he's done by looking at those tropes. Chuck helps him figure it out by their combined knowledge of horror films and slasher films. And I just love the fact that it does this. It, It is a love letter to horror in the same way that Scream was. Scream was a love letter to horror. In fact, I do think they lean a little towards the Wes Craven here because some of the character names obviously I've already mentioned Jamie but some of the character names are a little close to home here we have Drew who could be a reference to Drew Barrymore who of course was in Scream but we have I think one of the best sort of triumvirates for this that clearly says that Wes Craven was was a big influence we have a character called Nancy a character called Heather and of course one of the guys is called Freddy, all of which I think are leading us to A Nightmare on Elm Street. Freddy Krueger, the character of Nancy, played by Heather Langenkamp. If this is just some weird coincidence, then that's genius, by accident, but I get the feeling it's on purpose. There's a book that we see in the film called The Mortal Tally, which basically spawned the idea for this film. This is so well layered with hints of its origins and its influences, and I love that. 
I love the fact that it does that so well. And like I say, subverts the genre. We don't watch a masked killer from the distance and try and figure out who it is and why he's doing it. We are, dare I say, rooting for the killer in this. Because we see Sam as just an unwitting pawn. He is drawn to this mask that is making him kill. You know, based on the story he tells everyone in the group. And before I talk about, one, I think, one of the best bits of this film, I do quickly want to say as well, the ending is so well done. The fact that we have the final girl actually succumbing to the thing that she's meant to be stopping. Which technically makes her get rid of the killer from before, but then she kind of becomes the killer, I suppose. But we do get a hint to this. The final girl, the trope of that, is that you are as pure as the driven snow. You have to have no black marks on your record. You are the virginous, homely kind of girl. Typical girl next door. And in killing Amani, she's already made a step to a darker outcome. But the thing I really, really want to tip my hat off to in this is Fran Kranz. Uh, amazing performance. There are f a few actors out there who can do what I call fighting with themselves. It's very advanced miming, if you think about it, because your compulsion is not to fight yourself in most cases. It's very difficult if you're kind of going, oh, I'm going to touch my face, and then you're pretending to fight against it. It's very hard to make that look convincing. Frank Kranz in this film does that so well when he's fighting against himself to you know, have the mask sort of come to him and be put on his face. The only other person who immediately comes to mind, and again it makes a lot of thematic sense, is Bruce Campbell. His work in Evil Dead films is spectacular. He's a great physical actor, and I would, yeah, like I say, I would put Frank Kranz on that same level. It's very convincing. And it, like I said, it's so hard to do. He's helped here with a lot of distortion effects and shaking of the camera and what have you. It really does help sell it. I will not take that away from, you know, the camera crew and the visual effects guys. But you've got to have the raw materials there. And he's got to have been convincing enough at the beginning to still sell it even through that. He does amazingly here. And like I say, I love this film because of what it does. It just, you know, tips its hat to all the 80s slashers, and as I say, particularly Wes Craven, it seems to have a thing for. It loves its source material, it pays great respect to it, but it's an entertaining film in its own right. It's not perfect at all. It's got its flaws. But did I enjoy my time with it both times that I've watched it? Yes, I did. And that's all that I can ask for. That's all that I need out of a, a piece of entertainment like this. Did it keep me entertained? Did it make me think, I want to tell people who don't know about this to go and watch it, because it is great? Yes, it did, and I implore you to go out and watch it again, or for the first time, and of course watch Creep 2 ready for next week. But that's all my thoughts on You Might Be The Killer. Great film, fun, worth a blast. So thank you very much for watching, and until next time, as always, take care. <laughs>